the first topic that I have started now, that is fractures of the trochanteric region. On December 1st, I spoke about fracture neck of femur as a part of the fractures of the proximal femur. The second common proximal fracture is a trochanteric fracture. But of course, we used to call them as extra capsular fractures, say about two to three decades ago. Now we generally call them as trochanteric fractures. Once again, let us recall what is a trochanteric fracture, what is a fracture neck of femur, briefly for a minute by this small line drawing. Once again, this is the head of the femur and and up to this it is neck. From this region, up to this region, we generally call them as trochanteric region. This is because the entire line of treatment changes depending upon if it is just a fracture neck of femur or a trochanteric fracture. Trochanteric fracture is once again divided into three parts. This is known as per trochanteric. Only trochanteric is involved. Greater trochanteric is involved, lesser trochanteric is not involved. Then intertrochanteric fracture up to this. Intertrochanteric. And third fracture which comes here and goes below this is not called subtrochanteric. This is the basic concept that is a tro only fracture involved in the tro greater trochanter. Second one is going up to lesser trochanter and then coming down the trochanter into the proximal femur. This is the basic concept or basic classification of any fractures of the trochanteric region. But here again, because the treatment concept changes depending upon whether the fracture is stable or unstable. Stable fractures necessarily require fixation whereas sometimes unstable fracture where there are no facilities can be managed by conservative management. Nowadays, don't see anybody with any conservative management, especially in general, most of the private hospitals and all that. But still, because of lack of equipment, lack of operation time and all that still, because of the comorbid conditions, some of the people still where the fracture is stable to manage conservatively. And best of course if you can do, surgery is the best even for them. Unstable always surgery. And then again, depending on the number of fragments also some people grossly communicated. Sometimes what happens, the part of the neck also is involved posteriorly. So that we call the cervical trochanteric fractures. So little bit of variations are there, but basically Unstable fractures, they require surgery. Stable fractures can be managed conservatively or by surgical means. This is the fundamental classification of any treatment of a trochanteric fracture. Signs and symptoms, most important, history is very, very important. Very often, the fall from a height or landing directly on the trochanter. One, two. Directly falling on outer aspect of thigh. To explain this, fall from a height, naturally somebody is walking somewhere at a height, they may fall down. So to fall from a height, several fractures can occur, starting from cervical spine injury, dorsal spine injury, dorsal lumbar, lumbar, fracture pelvis, and then this one. And of course, going down, as we go down, there could be a fracture femur, a trochanteric femur, sorry, intercondylar fracture, ankle fracture, calcane fracture, all these things can happen if there is a fall from height. One among them is a fractured trochanteric fracture. Second thing, somebody falls, he lands on the side, then lands directly on the trochanter. Then also this can happen. So, it is an age. Normally, fracture neck of femur occurs in elderly people. Age, trochanteric fracture can occur at any age. That is starting from adolescent age. It's not common in children. Very, very unusual to have a trochanteric fracture in a child. So it starts from adolescent age, but more so in adults 
up to the old age also it can occur but whereas fracture neck of femur is more common in elderly osteoporotic patients then sex males have males more, have more preponderance of this fracture because most of the people are active people working at heights and then people are more vigorously indulging in labor work and all that so it's more common among males not that it's uncommon in females between the two males are more often in have a trochanteric fracture what are the symptoms of these fractures these fractures we can make a diagnosis from a distance as the patient is with plot or a stretcher you can easily make out by just looking at the patient from a distance what's the problem so just have a look at the patient then the commonest thing is the attitude of the limb attitude of general person is different this is the attitude of the limb that is involved in a fracture so attitude of limb otherwise known as the position of the limb when you examine most important thing you see is external rotation you see normally both the feet are like that when there is a trochanteric fracture the limb falls like that the entire outer aspect of the foot touches the couch or the bed whatever it is so this is the most important once again i repeat the feet are like this following a fracture near the trochanteric region the foot turns like this and the outer aspect of the foot literally touches the couch which is normally not possible there is apparent shortening so the minute you look at the limbs at the patient on the couch you see the one lower limb which is here another foot here that is the apparent shortening you can make out foot is external rotated like this and it's shorter when compared to the other one these two things are just by looking at the patient we can see these two things and then the limb is shifted towards the midline which we call it as varus so the attitude of the limb the minute you see them it is gone inside external rotated and short and compared to the normal limb so these are the three things by looking at the attitude of the limb on the examining couch we have got to suspect a trochanteric fracture and what are the other things the patient complains of severe pain pain near trochanteric region and inability to stand number 3 all movements of the hip hip movements are painful this is the complaint these are the complaints patient say that pain is there near the trochanteric region he can't stand hip movements are painful that is the presentation complaint with which the patients come to us following a fall i already i told you about the attitude the minute you look at the patient you can see the limb is as i already mentioned shortened externally rotated and deviated towards the midline known as varus and with this complaints and that attitude of the limb we suspect what else we have got to see before we send the patient for x rays for confirmation this is a teaching little bit of a teaching discussion that's why i'm telling you normally what happens nowadays we don't do that much of examination of the patient because it's a very painful condition and then if you go on examining and trying to put the things as if it's a case being presented in the examination or in the outpatient department very difficult but still the basic things one should not forget so once you see the patient with that history and that kind of a attitude of the limb then what else you have got to see you look at the trochanter swelling near trochanter two sometimes there may be contusion or ecchymosis there may be a contusion or the fracture is very severe sometimes you can see there is a ecchymosis because we have got to distinguish initially a fracture neck of femur from a trochanteric fracture so this swelling of near the trochanter then contusion ecchymosis 3 tenderness 4 the shortening is more than 1 inch or 2.5 cm shortening is more than 2.5 cm usually in fracture neck of femur the shortening will not be that much 
but whereas if you have a trochanteric fracture, it is usually more than 2.5 centimeters. So if the short limb is very gross and there is swelling near trochanter, contusion, ecchymosis, tenderness and shortening more than 2.5 centimeters. And in addition to that in between, with contusion, ecchymosis, the trochanter is fine elevated also. If the trochanter is elevated and compared to the other side, these are all signs and symptoms of a fracture of the trochanteric region. Then at this stage, what is that we have got to do? The management consists of initial first aid, diagnosis and planning of the treatment. What is first aid? First, first aid we give. What we give is we give a fixed skin traction so that there will not be much of a movement. Fixed traction to analgesia. Quick assessment of comorbid condition like a hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, then peripheral vascular disease. E, lungs or pulmonary diseases. So these are the basic things you have got to quickly assess before we take the patient. Because depending upon these things, how you do for plan your analgesia and all that also is important. In certain comorbid conditions, we can't give certain drugs. So quickly assess and find out how the other comorbid condition, especially if the patient is a of beyond the age of 50, 60. You have got to take care of all these things. Whether for a young person, there is no problem. Then what is that you have got to do? So I have had given the first aid, then quick assessment of all these things. You have got to plan what you are going to do. So for this, you have to confirm the diagnosis. Confirmation. This confirmation is very, very important because Depending upon what type of a fracture, is stable, unstable, number of fragments, where exactly it is broken, all these things decide our way of tackling this patient. So confirmation consists of X-ray of the pelvis, including both hips. There is always a tendency on the part of the people to take X-ray of only one hip that is involved. But as a routine, you must have always a comparing, comparing normal limb. That's why when you take the x-ray of the hip, better to call it x-ray of the pelvis including both hips. Here AP view to lateral view. Sometimes taking lateral view may be difficult. If there is no lateral view, we can compromise. Because nowadays when you go to the, take the patient to the theatre, we will be knowing the lateral view we can take easily by using the what is known as C arm nowadays. So if the patient is not cooperative, the minimum view that is necessary is AP view. Lateral view, view will help us plan better in choosing the proper implant for fixation of the fracture. So that's why both the views are always important. But you can compromise when the patient is elderly, not cooperating, then we can somehow manage with the AP view. But an attempt must always be made to take a proper lateral view. Then at the same sitting, because you are likely to get an operation done, usually better to take X-ray of the chest PA view to avoid shifting the patient too many times from the X-ray department or to the bed. Even though still we can take bed X-rays, if possible if you take the X-rays in the same department quickly, it's always better. So whenever you think that you are likely to get the operation done or the patient is likely to go for surgery, better always take the X-ray of chest PAV also so that we can avoid unnecessary too much of movements of the patient. Then at the same time you have got facilities for ECG, that also you take. Then in elderly people, 2 day echo. Because even though you got the confirmation comes up to this, Confirmation. But this is for assessing and planning. We require extra of the chest and 2D echo and ECG also. These are the minimum things we require because, as I already mentioned earlier, these people will have comorbid conditions for the anesthetist to decide whether the patient is fit enough for surgery, number one, whether he, what type of anesthesia he could give to the patient. So they always ask us. That's why. I insist upon taking extra of the pelvis, AP and lateral view along with that, extra of chest, PA view, ECG, 2 echo. Because all these things 
usually available in the same department and you can save a lot of time. Then plan the definitive treatment. Now, once you take the x-ray, what are the features that you have got to see in the x-ray? One, quality of bone, whether the patient has got any osteoporosis or normal bones. Two, the fracture line. Three, the displacement of the fragments. Four, sometimes there may be associated or other fractures. Oh, when you take an x-ray, just it's not the sufficient. You say, ah, okay, there's a fracture neck of femur, a trochanter fracture. You've got to see the quality of the bone. For osteoporotic patient, the implant that we are going to use is going to be something different for a normal person. Similarly, the fracture line is very, very important. Suppose there's a trochanter. The trochanter will be like this. You want to know the fracture line is here or upside down or it may be running into the subtrochantic region. So the, depending upon this fracture line, we will have to plan the surgery. Sometimes there is a small avulsion fracture. This can be easily treated with a small screw or even consider nothing will happen. That's why you must always know what are the things to be seen in the x-rays. So depending upon quality, fracture line, displacement fracture and associated other fractures. Then what are types of treatment options that are available? As I have mentioned already in the beginning, in the introduction, one is conservative treatment, which more or less is abandoned. But trochanter fractures, we don't usually use this conservative management, but still under circumstances, uh, some circumstances in government hospitals and where the people can't afford, there may be comorbid conditions and all that. Rarely, probably, probably about three decades, four decades ago, most of the people were may being managed with conservative treatment, which consists of what is known as Steenman spin. S T E I N M A W N. Steenman spin. Traction. Usually, we are giving this traction where the patient's general condition is not good, we are likely to produce more complications like pulmonary edema, pneumonitis, urinary infection, and all that, but pressure source. So nowadays, practically, we stop the, this spin traction business. So most of the fun we do only surgery. This surgery previously, at the evolution come, we used to simply what is known as a nail plate. The nail goes into the neck of the femur and part of the this one this comes out like this. And this is fixed with a plate. Some of the early plates and screws, they had their own difficulties. The screw used to come out. And then, now the latest type of plate we have, another plate is fixed like this. And this old type of things are known as Jewett's nail plate and all that. Nowadays we don't use them at all. But now there are a lot of improvement. Now the main thing that we use, what is known as dynamic hip compression screw, DHS. So here the older one, there never used to be any compression at the fracture site. We just used to put it like this. There used to be a lot of this and this one is to work out of the head of the femur also. Now the most commonly used thing is dynamic hip screw. Dynamic DHS. Dynamic. Why you are able to use it more? Because nowadays we can have intra we can have intraoperative guidance with what is known as C arm. When this was not there, there used to be a lot of problem because for fixing these fractures initially <coughs> We require guide wire. This guide wire's length, positioning, all these things are very important for us. If in one view it looks like as if it is going into the neck of the femur and head of the femur. But unfortunately, if you take a lateral view, that is the neck will be like this and the pin will be somewhere like this or maybe below. The neck is there, but in AP view, one behind the other. They look as if the central position is there. This is a very deceptive thing. That's why we take lateral view with C arm. The advantage of the C arm is the patient will be stable on the bed. The X ray can be rotated in any direction and then we can get the proper view. Because of this major advancement of C arm, last 20 30 years, we are able to exactly position this wire, that is, the guide wire. And once this guide wire is in position, screw will have uh, this, it is a 
cannulated screw like this. These are threads. Once we know the correct position, we can actually push the cannulated head of the screw inside and check the position. For this also, of course, various things are there, like how much length is needed, some 65 millimeter onwards, we go up to 100, 110, like that, depending upon the physique of the personality. In India, usually in India, 75, 95, 70 to 95 millimeters will be sufficient, but in most of the people in USA and all that, where the personality is more than 6, 5, 7 feet and all that, probably may require even up to 110 millimeters of this. So that screw we take. We thread it and then we put the plate, barrel is there, into the barrel we put this and then this will come out and this is the shaft and in this here this plate fixed again depending upon the necessity three or four and again this one is fixed with what is as small screw, black screw. So once this entire thing is assembled properly there is a compression at the fracture side once there is compression, any fracture will get united faster if there is a compression plate. Now, there are so many variations which have come of late. The basic concept is to see that proper compression is there and there is no rotation of the fragments. So, we have got now a what is known as PFN, Proximal Femoral Nail. This nail, we won't be disturbing the fracture site at all from the trochanter, which is broken like this. Here, we don't touch it. From superficial near the trochanter, we pass a guide wire like this. Once this trochanter is there, because we are not disturbing the fracture site, there will not be much of a damage. And then we put the cannulated nail will be there, that nail will be passed up to this area. So once we fix it, now what we do, we don't want that nail which is there inside the femur to rotate it. Then we fix it with screws again, like that. If necessary, two or three, depending upon this is a proximal femoral nail. Of course, little, <coughs> these are all variables of the same principle where we don't want because too many fragments are there. If you go and disturb, then it becomes very difficult to get a proper alignment. In that case, we try to use the proximal, one is DHS dynamic hip screw to PFN, that is proximal. The problem with all these things is, we try to fix the things, that is we are trying to achieve union of the fracture, because the osteoporotic nature even though our fixation may, good, may look very good, sometimes the screws may come out or you don't have a proper X-ray technician to help you in this way on, you may be positioning your screw in a wrong area. The best position is, best position should be ensured before you fix the fragment. Otherwise, sometimes the screw may work out or it may collapse, all these things can occur. So, these are all the things. One more thing nowadays, we are doing it very elderly patients if they come with trochanter. Suppose if a, there is a trochanter fracture like this here or here. So, what we are trying to do is nowadays, if the fracture is like this, we don't want the patient to wait in bed without walking and without moving. So, what we are trying to do is, these fragments which are broken, we try to put it back by using cement and recreate and then use a process just like we do for fracture neck of femur. So we prepare the bed and put lot of cement here and then use the processes. This is some people call it as trochanter plasty or some people call it cemented hemi-arthroplasty. The idea is if you put a cement and try to get them together, if necessary put a couple of screws to fix these fragments, then what we can achieve is good fixation so that patient can start moving immediately or maximum within a couple of days. So most of them, once again I repeat, it occur, those fractures occur in elderly patients. So if we do some of this 
latest improvements of using cemented arthroplasty or even put the fragments together make them into a normal trochanter by using wires screws etc to get back the near anatomy of the original femur and then do a proximal processes or that is known as hemi arthroplasty so with these different kinds of things the idea is number 1 good anatomical reduction the basic principles are good anatomical reduction rigid internal fixation three early mobilization with weight bearing or without weight bearing with or without weight bearing depending upon the quality of the bone if the quality of the bone is very poor don't allow complete weight to give a walker and make the walk if the quality of the paper is poor and you doubt your internal fixation or the anatomical reduction don't make the patient walk immediately so what you do is we make them walk with the help of a walker so that there will not be complications of lying down in the bed for more than 2 weeks as you know on the patients lie down in the bed for more than 2 weeks one after another all the complications like pressure sores urinary infection bears and pneumonitis or then of course like in in our country and nations it's not that common most common problem is deep vein thrombosis honestly speaking in my 50 years actually i'll be 50 and completing entering ortho department by june 50 years i joined in 1965 in my 50 years of experience with arthropedic patient i hardly saw more than one or two deep vein thrombosis but now it's a very dreaded complication especially in white people and we got to take all the necessary precautions to make the patient mobilize early and of course now no molecular heparin is available to prevent this deep vein thrombosis all those things are to be used if needed so this completes more or less the trochanteric fracture classification confirmation of diagnosis first aid and different types of management thank you